Albertian Institute of Science and Technology make engineers not just engineering graduates. Good day and welcome to this presentation from Albertian Institute of Science and Technology, ISAT Kalamasiri. We are sure this program will help you in your final preparation for the forthcoming engineering entrance examination. For this exam, we have two parts. The first part is physics and chemistry and the second part is mathematics. In the physics and chemistry part, you will be having 120 questions and the time allotted will be two and a half hours. So you get one minute and a few seconds for each question. So if you wait long to find the answer for a question, you lose time to work out the remaining questions. So what we suggest is you do a few, a few questions in physics come back and you do a few questions in chemistry so that you will be able to balance both the subjects. You have 72 questions in physics and 48 in chemistry. So for every two questions in physics, you do one question in chemistry so that your marks will be balanced. Again, you have your negative marking scheme, so if you do one question right and go wrong in four, your score will be zero. So make sure that whatever you answer is correct. If you have any doubt about any answer, don't attempt that particular question and proceed to the next. So about chemistry, what we suggest to you is to learn the following points. From the plus one part, in the basic concepts of chemistry, you should know the statements of Dalton's atomic theory. They can ask you about, they can give you the statements. One statement will not be belonging to that and ask you to find out which is the right one. You should be clear about the terms isotopes, isobars and isotones. You should know the mole concept the Avogadro's number, the molar volume, and you can have problems based on that. You should be able to convert the percentage composition into empirical formula and molecular formula. Also, you'll have questions from stoichiometry and uh, calculations based on balanced chemical equation. They might give you one uh, compound and ask you, from so many grams of this compound, how many grams of the next the product will be available. So you should be able to answer such questions. Getting on to the structure of atoms, you should know the properties of cathode rays, anode rays, then the E by M ratio, the, the people who discovered the fundamental particles of atoms, the atom models, Thomson's model, your Rutherford's experiment, the Rutherford's model, board model and its uh, deficiencies. You should also be clear with the dual nature of matter, the two equations, the de Broglie relation and the uh, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. The shapes of orbitals, the S, the P, P and F orbitals and uh, the PX, PY, PZ. Similarly, D, five of them. And you should be clear with filling of electrons in atomic orbitals, the Pauli's principle, the Oppo principle, and the Hunt's rule. And certain numbers are there, like atomic number 24 and 29, where the half-filled and the completely filled orbitals come up. So you should not make mistakes on those numbers. Normally they ask you chromium atomic number 24. So that uh, should be what you need doing the electronic configuration of atoms. Moving to the third chapter, you have a periodic table. You should be clear about the groups, 18 groups, seven periods, lanthanides, actinides, 120 elements in now. Okay, you should know the first classification starting from Dobrainer to Newlands to Mendeleev and to Mosley's experiment leading to the long form of the periodic table. 
Now, you should know how the properties like atomic radii, ionic radii, ionization enthalpy, electron gain enthalpy, and valency vary in a period and in a group. If the atomic number of an element is given, you should be able to find out the position. You should be able to give the element belongs to so-and-so group, the element belongs to so-and-so period, which you can do by writing the electronic configuration on the rough phase, which is available on your question paper. Going to the fourth module, where you have chemical bonding and molecular structure, the three types of bonding, the ionic bonding, the covalent bonding, and the coordinate bonding. Their deviation from octet rule, many compounds, they have more than eight electrons around the central atom, but are stable. Then you have the Fajan's rule, where you have the polarizability of the ions. You have the VSEPR theory giving the geometry of the molecule, which the bond angle can vary from normal conditions. You have the hybridization, where you involve the S orbital, P orbital, and D orbital. You have the molecular orbital theory, the bonding and antibonding orbitals. And there you come to the concept of bond order bond length and bond energy. You should be clear as the bond order increases, bond length decreases and bond energy increases. So you should be able to mention which molecule or the molecule ion is more stable or which is having the low, longest bond length or shortest bond length. You have to calculate the bond order in each case, which is given the number of electrons in bonding orbital minus number of electrons in anti-bonding orbital divided by two. You should be clear with the concept of hydrogen bonding, how the properties of molecules can change when there is hydrogen bonding, like uh, the physical properties changing. Going into states of matter, the gases, you have the gas laws, the Boyle's law, the Charles law, the Avogadro's law. You should be clear with that, the problems using these laws the gas constant, the ideal gas equation, and uh, how certain gases deviate from uh, ideal nature, the reason for deviations. Then coming into Van der Waals equation of state, we have the Van der Waals constants A and B, and coming on to liquefaction of gases, the critical constants, the critical temperature, the critical pressure, and critical volume. And you should be able to connect them with the, the Van der Waals constant, the A and B. Chemical thermodynamics dealing with the energy change during chemical reactions, exothermic, endothermic reactions, the extensive and intensive properties, state functions, Hess's law. Always you have a question based on Hess's law, which can give you, they will give you a set of reactions and ask you to find out the final reaction and the energy change during the reaction. So that is always there. Heat of neutralization, which gives a constant value for strong acid, strong base. The spontaneity of chemical change, where delta, the sign of delta G is noted. So you should know the equation, gibbs cell notes equation, delta G is equal to delta H minus T delta S. You will be able to calculate the temperature at which the reaction will become spontaneous, the, when the reaction is going to be at equilibrium, delta G zero. All these you should be able, and you should be able to work out problems using the first law, second law of thermodynamics. Moving to chemical equilibrium. You should know what are the factors that affect the chemical equilibrium. You have the very famous Le Chatelier's principle. The variation of equilibrium when you change the temperature, when you change concentration, when you change pressure, when you introduce a, a noble gas into the system. You should be familiar with that. You should know the calculation of equilibrium constant. You should know Kp and Kc, the relation between the two, and the factors that affect what happens to the chemical equilibrium when you add the inert gas or when you add a reactant, add a product, remove a product, remove a reactant. Delta H value, how the temperature has to be adjusted for the maximum product. 
how the pressure has to be checked, the number of molecules on the reactant side, number of molecules on the product side. So you should be able to say what is the best condition to get the maximum products. When you move into ionic equilibrium, you have the ionization constant, the degree of ionization. When you go into a polybasic acid, you'll be having Ka1, Ka2, depending on the basicity of acids, how the acid strength varies, depending on the K value, you should be able to say which acid is stronger. You have the pH, the negative logarithm of a hydrogen ion concentration. You have the pH indicators, which give, show you the pH value, buffer solution, keeping constant pH, common ion effect, how you can precipitate a substance you, by adding certain substances. Salt hydrolysis, when you dissolve a salt in water, the pH of the solution may not be seven. How that is happening, the Henderson equation is there, hydrolysis of salts, the solubility and the solubility product. Adjusting the solubility product, you should be able to know how, how much solubility is there. Moving on to redox reactions, the three concepts of uh, oxidation and reduction, the classical concept, the, ox the electronic concept, and the oxidation number concept. You should know how to calculate the oxidation number of any element in a given compound. The rules should be familiar to you. And what happens to the oxidation number or the oxidation state during oxidation and reduction? How the number is going to change? Going to the ninth chapter, you learn about hydrogen, how to prepare hydrogen in the lab, how to prepare hydrogen at home, how to prepare hydrogen in the industry, you call it manufacture. The compounds, the binary compounds of hydrogen, which you call hydrides, classify it to ionic covalent. Okay, then we have water. You might think how, what to learn about water, hard water, soft water, what are the reasons for hardness, and how you can remove the hardness from water. Heavy water, mind you, India is the highest exporter of heavy water. That's a plus point for the country. Hydrogen peroxide, how to prepare hydrogen peroxide, how to express the concentration of hydrogen peroxide solution, and the reactions. They ask you more about the reducing nature of hydrogen peroxide. All of us know it's an oxidizing agent, but reducing nature. S-block elements, how you prepare uh, group one, sodium, how you prepare uh, group two, magnesium, calcium, you should be able to know that. You shouldn't be able to know how the important compounds of these elements are uh, manufactured. Sodium thiosulfate, which is being used as an anti chlorine to remove chlorine from bleached material and being used as an antidote for cyanide poisoning. And biological importance, the sodium potassium pump. Then coming to salts of calcium, this is where you make a mistake, lime, milk of lime, lime water. Now, when you have slaked lime, people say, okay, slaked lime, milk of lime, lime water, all three are same. Yeah, chemically all three are same, but they have different activities. Yeah, Epsom salt, plaster Paris, cement, how gypsum is converted to plaster Paris. Biological importance of calcium and magnesium, the compounds in biological systems containing those. You're going into P-block elements, you have a group 13, where you have your um, boron, boron and aluminum. About boron, you should be able to know what is borax, the borax bead test, boric acid, boron hydrides, the banana bond, or the three center two electron bond. You should be very clear about that. Then aluminum, its extraction, its amphoteric nature, reacting with acids as well as alkali forming salt. Alums, they are very important compound, the double sulfates. When you go into group 14, you start with carbon, the property of carbon of catenation, which is giving you the large number of compounds, which you call the organic compounds, the allotropic forms of uh, carbon. You should know the structure, why graphite is a conductor when diamond is a non-conductor, and the new iron, the same allotrope, fullerene. Then when you come into this group onwards, you see something called the inert pair effect. 
the S electrons not taking part in bonding. So when you come down the group, instead of showing plus four, lead is showing plus two. Same thing was there in uh, group 13 also, bismuth showing plus one rather than plus three. Then these oxides of carbon and silicon, calcium carbide, uh, calcium carbide and silicon carbide, silicon tetrachloride, silicons, zeolites, the uses, you should be very clear. Getting on to organic chemistry, the first chapter deals with the basic principles. They can give you a compound and ask you about the IUPAC names. So you should be clear with the rules for naming compounds as per IUPAC system. How to find out what are the elements present in the compound? That's your qualitative analysis. Test for carbon, hydrogen. You have sulfur, nitrogen, halogens. You can test the presence of all these elements. You can also find out the quantity of these elements present in the given compound and reach on to the percentage composition. And that is going to help you to find out the molecular formula of the compound. Come to the empirical formula and molecular formula, which we discussed earlier in the first unit. Then the inductive effect, electromeric effect, resonance effect, hyperconjugation, all these, how the properties of a class of compounds can change. The reactive intermediates present in organic chemistry, the free radicals, the carbocations, the carboanions. Carbocations, you might come across the name carbonium ions. So that's the same. So the attacking reagent, the ions that take part in chemical reactions, classified as electrophiles, electron seeking, nucleophiles, nuclear seeking, types of organic reactants like substitution, addition, all such reactions, elimination, decomposition reactions, all these will come across in this particular chapter. And they can ask you addition reactions or elimination reactions. You should be familiar with the Markovnikov's rule. You should be familiar with the Seitzev rule. We'll come across those rules in the coming chapters. Then we have the isomerism. That's an important property, what you see in organic compounds. The structural isomerism is there. Stereoisomerism is there. Five varieties of structural isomerism. Two varieties of geometric, uh, stereoisomerism, geometrical and optical. When you come into geometrical isomerism, the cis and trans isomers. When you come to optical isomerism, the dextro and labo forms. You have the name enantiomers and diastereoisomers. As the number of uh, asymmetric centers increase, you go in for diastereoisomers. If you have only one center, you have enantiomers. You have the mesoform and the racemic modification. Types of reactions which we came across, the order of the reaction, SN1, SN2 mechanisms, E1 and E2. Which molecule can give you E1 and E2 reaction or SN1 and SN2 reactions? Coming on to hydrocarbons, you classify them aliphatic, aromatic. When you come to aliphatic, the alkanes, alkenes, and alkynes, you have to learn the preparation and properties how alkanes can be prepared. They can give you a reaction and ask you what is the compound. So only if you are sure with the reactions, you will be able to uh, sort out which is the product that I can get. You should know the sets of rule during elimination to form alkenes. You should know Markovnikov's rule when you add something to an alkene. You should know the peroxide effect or the Karash effect you should know the polymerization reactions of alkenes and alkynes. How you distinguish between alkane and alkene, the Bayes test or the KMNO4 test. You should be familiar with all these reactions, the cyclization reaction, aromatization, isomerization, pyrolysis, all these reactions you should know. How you come across uh, the triple bonded molecules, alkynes, the terminal hydrogen, those molecules reacting with the silver nitrate, with the copper halide, the precipitate formation. That's the way you distinguish whether it is a terminal hydrogen or the triple bond is 
inside the molecule, not at the end. Then how to distinguish between alkane, alkene, and alkyne. Aromatic hydrocarbons, the electron-rich nature of uh, these molecules, and they give electrophilic substitution reactions like uh, nitration. What is the electrophile that is acting there? Sulfonation, what is the electrophile? That molecule is not having charge. The electrophile is not having charge, but still it's acting as the electrophile. Halogenation, what are the catalysts that you use? Friedel Krafts reaction, whether you have alkylation or acylation, what are the catalysts that can be used there? Then when you come into the monosubstituted compounds, when you react it, what will be your product? The meta-directing groups, the orthoparadirecting groups, you should be familiar with all such things. And we say aromatic compounds are carcinogenic in nature, the toxicity of such molecules. And getting into environmental chemistry, that's a new branch which you have to deal with wherever you study, where you have your air pollution, soil pollution, water pollution. What are the compounds that give you such uh, pollutions? What are the, your smoke, dust, smog, the components in fume, mist? What are the sources? Coming into global warming, carbon dioxide, how it acts. So coming on to the plus two part, we start with solid state, the seven crystal systems, the 14 revised lattices, the unit cell, the three types of unit cells. You should be familiar with all those. You should be able to calculate the number of particles per unit cell, then how the particles, how the unit cells are packed together, the voids, the point defects, the electrical and magnetic properties. When you learn on point defects, be clear with Frengel defects, short key defects, the metal excess defects, the metal deficiency defects. What are the compounds which show Frengel defect? That's what they ask you, which shows. And there is also a compound, silver bromide, which shows uh, your Frengel defect as well as short key defect. Different types of crystals like sodium chloride, they might ask you, what is the uh, crystal structure of a particular one showing so-and-so uh, -so arrangement. So getting on to solutions, you should be able to distinguish between molarity, molality, and mole fraction. You should be able to calculate these uh, values and how you interconvert these values. Coming on to ideal solutions, your Raoult's law, how the deviation, positive deviation, negative deviation, and uh, how if one component is showing positive deviation, the other one also showing positive deviation, all such properties, the colligative properties, which uh, are uh, based on the number of particles that are present in your solution. You calculate the, the depression and freezing point, the elevation and boiling point, the osmotic pressure, and a relative lowering of vapor pressure and uh, link it on to the molecular weight. In electrochemistry, you should know how electrode potential is caused, how you calculate cell potential and EMF of the cell using your electrochemical series, and what is the charge on the anode and cathode, the reverse nature from an electrolytic cell, your standard hydrogen electrode, the applications of electrochemical cells, your Faraday's laws, primary and secondary cells, the chargeable and uh, non-chargeable cells. You should be very familiar with your Leclanche cell and lead that acid battery, the mercury cell, the fuel cells. Then when you get into conductance of solutions, how the molar conductance is going to vary with dilution in the case of strong electrolytes, in the case of weak electrolytes. And there we come across the very famous law, Kohlrash's law. One problem is there from Kohlrash's law every time. Corrosion, how corrosion is happening, the different methods for preventing corrosion, the rates of reactions, how it is going to how the concentration is going to affect the rate of reaction, how the temperature is going to affect the rate of reaction, order of a reaction, molecularity of a reaction, the rate law, the rate constant. If you get 
the unit of rate constant, you should be able to say what is the order of the reaction. It's uh, very easy to find out the order of a reaction from the unit of the rate constant, the integrated rate equation, half-life period for the first order reaction, how to link half-life period and uh, k value, the Arrhenius equation which gives you the dependence of temperature on the rate constant. In surface chemistry, we deal with the absorption and adsorption, the applications of adsorption, the two different types of adsorption, the adsorption isotherms, getting onto colloids, how you prepare the colloids, that's always a question. Different types of uh, methods by which you prepare the colloid, the properties of colloids, the light optical property, Tyndall effect, electrical property, electrophoresis, the mechanical property, your Brownian movement, all that comes up. The coagulation of colloids, the Hardy Schultz rule, the Sigmundi's gold number, how you protect a colloid, and the applications of colloids in uh, industry and in life. In metallurgical operations, you should know the difference between the ore and the mineral, how ores are concentrated, the different methods to concentrate the ore, if it is sulfide ore, if it is oxide ore, how you do your concentration, and then your heat treatment followed by extraction of the metal, how you purify the metal. They will ask you so-and-so metal purified by so-and-so method, or so-and-so metal extracted by so-and-so method from its ore. So you should be able to say, and how you remove the impurities gang to be removed by adding flux, forming slag, and how the slag is protecting your metal from oxidation. And uh, you should know important O's of certain elements. Um, the syllabus mentions iron, aluminum, copper, and silver, and uh, their extractions. When you get on to P-block elements, the continuation of what you did in your plus one part, the next groups from group 15, the nitrogen family, ammonia, nitric acid, preparation properties of both the compounds, the oxoacids of nitrogen and phosphorus, the oxides of nitrogen and phosphorus, getting on to the next group, the oxygen sulfur group, ozone, how it is prepared, its properties, sulfuric acid, how it is manufactured, the properties of sulfuric acid. Any one reaction they can ask you, how uh, dehydration, oxidation, all these properties shown by sulfuric acid. Coming on to halogens, the oxo acids of halogen, how the strength is varying the um, hydrogen halides, how the strength of the acid is varying, getting on to noble gases, now a new compound, oxides and fluorides are there. You should be able to give their structures. D and F block, what we have is the general properties of the, these metals. You should be very familiar with the oxidation states, the catalytic nature, the alloy formation, the variable oxidation states, how you prepare potassium dichromate, how you prepare potassium permanganate, the reactions, KMnO4 acting as oxidizing agent in three media, either neutral or uh, alkaline or acidic, which is best and why. And when you come to F block elements, lanthanide contraction is there, what are the consequences there? Co in coordination compounds, you should be familiar with the terms involved, ligands, monodendate, bidendate, tridendate, and so on. The coordination number, the, how the complex is formed, the oxidation state of the metal, because you, when you name the compound, you have to give the oxidation state of the metal atom types of ligands, how ring structures are formed by the ligand, the chelating ligands, the, how the molecule is formed, the theories of bonding, your valence bond theory and the crystal field theory, the John Teller effect. You should be able to give delta O values, then the nomenclature, the new nomenclature should be familiar, the isomerism in compounds, in coordination compounds and the importance of coordination compounds in industry. 
halo alkenes and halo arenes. This is where we left off in plus one and rejoined in plus two. The preparation, the properties, the reactions of uh, halo alkenes. You have your SN1 and SN2 substitution. Primary halo alkenes always giving SN2. Uh, tertiary always giving SN1. Secondary can give both. So the reactions, nucleophilic substitution reactions, and especially you should note your potassium cyanide, silver cyanide, potassium nitrite, silver nitrite, because cyanide and uh, nitrite, they are ambident reagents. How your haloalkanes react with metals, you have the very famous Wurtz reaction, you have the preparation of Grignard reagent, all these you have the Frankland reagent, should be familiar with that. The elimination reactions, the states of rule should be there. You should learn about chloroform and iodoform. The iodoform test is very important. Haloarenes, how you prepare them by Sandmeyer's reaction, Gatterman's reaction, and uh, by electrophilic substitution reactions. Why aromatic haloalkanes give nucleophilic substitution and uh, electrophilic substitution? Uh, why? Uh, electrophilic substitution, nucleophilic substitution. Why only nucleophilic substitution reactions? Then how your haloarenes are uh, reduced to benzene. Instead of Wurtz reaction in haloalkanes, we have Wurtz fitig reaction and fitig reaction. How alcohols are prepared, how they are classified into primary, secondary, and tertiary, the test to distinguish. That's a question that can come for you to distinguish primary, secondary, and tertiary alcohols. The reactions with PCL3, PCL5, SOCL2, these are the reactions which you learned in the preparation of haloalkanes. The reaction of uh, alcohols with the uh, acid chlorides and acid anhydrides, you'll repeat the same reactions in the formation of esters. So oxidation of uh, alcohols, the three classes of alcohols will differ in their activity towards uh, your oxidizing agents. Dehydration by passing over copper, all the dehydrogenation by passing over copper, how you convert your primary alcohol to secondary, secondary to tertiary, or backwards, how to distinguish between primary, secondary, and tertiary alcohol, getting onto phenols, how they are prepared, what are their properties, how the uh, reactions vary, how the OH group can be removed by distillation with zinc, how the esters are formed, how the ethers are formed, electrophilic substitution reaction, OH group being activated on bromination, giving you tribromophenol, nitration giving you picric acid, whereas all other molecules give only monosubstitution. Such reactions you also see in uh, aniline, you get bromination, but nitration, your amino group will get oxidized, so that will be a problem. The named reactions, Kolbe's reaction, Raymond-Tiemann reaction, the color reactions, you should be familiar with all such reactions of phenols. Ethers, the very famous Williamson synthesis. When you prepare ethers, you can use one part from acid chloride, the other part from alcohol as a sodium salt. So which one should you take when you prepare a certain class of ethers? How ethers react with the hydrogen iodide? Which part gets hydrogen? Which part gets uh, iodine? You should know all such things. The preparation of anisole, the phenolic ether, you should be very familiar. And uh, the electrophilic substitution reactions of ethers should also be taken care of. Moving on to aldehydes, ketones, and carboxylic acids. Certain reactions for the preparation of aldehydes from uh, alcohols, from acid chlorides, your Rosenman reduction, using your carboxylic acids, or the calcium salt or carboxylic acids, you can prepare all your aldehydes and ketones by adjusting the reagents. Your question will be, which will be the reagent that you take to prepare so-and-so aldehyde or ketone? Or when you take so-and-so carboxylic acid salts, what will be the aldehyde or ether that you get? And why nucleophilic addition reaction? No electrophilic addition reactions in 
carbonyl compounds. You have your reduction reaction, the named reaction, Clemenson reduction, Wolf-Kishner reduction, aldol condensation, cross aldol condensation, Canisaros reaction. They will just give you the reactant and the reagent. They will not tell you what is the reaction. You should be able to give the product. What are the difference between formaldehyde and acetaldehyde? What are, the, what are the differences between aldehydes and ketones? Aromatic aldehydes, how you prepare them? The nucleophilic reactions? How the aldehydes and ketones react with ammonia and ammonia derivatives? Your Canisaros reaction in the case of aromatic aldehyde? Benzoin condensation? Your Perkins reaction that you see only in the case of aromatic aldehydes, benzoin and Perkins, the electrophilic substitution, how the next substituent is directed by the carbonyl group. It's always meta-directing in nature. And how we distinguish between aromatic and uh, aliphatic aldehydes. When you get into carboxylic acid, you should be clear with uh, your HVZ reaction how you can decarboxylate a carboxylic acid to form your alkanes, whether the alkyl group will double up or the alkyl group will remain as such. Then the carboxylic acid derivatives, how the property is going to vary. You should also be very familiar with the, the acid strength, how the halogen substituted on the alkyl group is going to affect the acid strength The organic compounds containing nitrogen, the amines, the different classes of amines, the Hoffman's uh, degradation reaction for preparing amines, the Gabriel thalamide reaction, the classification into primary, secondary, and tertiary amines. How you distinguish between them? The aromatic amine, how you prepare it? the carbylamine reaction for primary amines, the electrophilic substitution reaction in the case of aniline. Most specifically, you'll be having reactions on aniline rather than aliphatic amines. So give more emphasis on reactions of aniline there. The diastonium salts, they are a very important class of compounds. You ask any compound, you can prepare it from diastonium salt. Halo compounds, which we learned, Sandmeyer reaction, Gatamans reaction, Balsheman reaction, all that. The hydrogen can be, uh, the N2Cl can be replaced by hydrogen, by OH, by NO2. Formation of dyes with phenol and aniline, all such reactions. When you get on to biomolecules, you have your first class of compounds, which are carbohydrates. Just uh, reducing and non-reducing sugars, you learn those examples. Then to test uh, glucose and fructose, how to distinguish between glucose and fructose. Few disaccharides, the names required, polysaccharides, just the names required, the link between uh, amino acids and proteins, which you call the peptide bond, enzymes and hormones, the names of enzymes and hormones and their activities, vitamins, you classify them into water soluble and uh, oil soluble vitamins, the different groups, uh, the different vitamins in uh, vitamin B, B1, B2, B3, and so on. All such compounds should be mentioned. And in nucleic acid, you should know the difference between RNA and uh, DNA, the basis present, the ribose and deoxyribose unit present. That sh should be your nucleic acids. Getting on to polymers, you should know the polymerization reaction to prepare certain polymers. That will be your question. And then uh, about uh, their structure, their classification, and how, what are the methods by which you can prepare your polymers. Chemistry in everyday life, you have a large number of compounds being used in medicine, different classes of medicine. You should know what you mean by analgesics, what you mean by tranquilizers, what you mean by antiseptics, what you mean by antimalarials. All these one or two examples you should learn because your question will be which of the following belongs to which class? the preservatives for food, the sweetening agent that we use, 
the antioxidant that we add to foods uh, to see that it doesn't get spoiled, soaps and detergents, how these compounds work. And uh, you should be able to do your entrance to the best of your ability. And uh, we at Albertian Institute of Science and Technology, ISAT Kalamashedi, we wish you all success in the upcoming entrance examination. Thank you. Thank you very much.